I was so busy installing a toilet or doing a this or talking to a customer that other customers that were calling me were not getting a phone call. So it's stupid. I had literal, literal opportunities calling me, but I was too busy doing it myself to actually answer when opportunity called. I had to learn to get over doing it myself. I had to learn through the hard road, and then I ultimately found partners that were the polar opposite of who I am. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for our dear friends, AJ and Pace. Give them a warm welcome as we do this amazing podcast. You know, when you're up here and talking to a lot of people, so many people already follow you, and they see everything that you're doing, right? Um, and first of all, I want to know how you get the energy. Like, I, I don't know how many conversations we've, I've had with people saying, how does he do all this all the time? I mean, you told last year, how many days were you traveling? I, I traveled 71 cities last year and I told myself that I was going to slow down. And so far I'm at 110 this year. Can I, can I ask a, a, maybe more of a personal question? Of course. Ask all the personal questions. How much money did it cost you to spend or to um, travel that much? This year, I think I'll spend, last year I spent a little over half a million dollars. I'll probably spend close to $800,000 this year. Yeah. So thank him for being here, guys, because I'm not paying him. Yeah, we spent a lot of money. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I pay, I pay money for proximity. It's the same thing. I was talking to Tommy just sec a second ago, just asking like, how great was this event so far? And he's like, it's like one, one hundredth of what it should have been. Like the value is so unbelievable. This, was this amazing today, guys? Yeah. yeah. Amazing. So yeah, I, I'm happy to pay. I'm happy to come and hang out. Anytime I can hang out with you and Tessa and, and everybody in your guys' whole entire sphere, I'm, I'm grateful. Now, you, you have this positive energy always about you. You're always going. Um, you've got a large company. How many employees do you have? Um, we have nine main companies, and we have a collective like 600 to 650 employees. I think a lot of people look at that, and they're just like, from, they're going, from where I stand, that seems impossible. Or I obviously don't have what Pace has when he was born and given, you know. Right, I, I was born with all of this, yeah. Exactly. So um, could you walk us through, dude? Like, first of all, how'd you get to this point? But, you know, talk about what you had to do personally to change and how to manage it all. Because I think most people, they, just, they look at it and it's like, oh, I either can't do that, mm -hmm. that's not possible. And uh, realizing you've crafted this, right? You built this and put yourself in a position you could do. How, how did you get from A to Z? I mean. Um, number one, not by myself. As you, I mean, I've met your team. George on your team is one of my favorite human beings ever. Phenomenal. Uh, love George. Yeah. Everybody knows George. Um, I love everybody on your team and, and you know, it shows a lot. I like for me, there's two things that shine out for me when I meet a new person that I admire and I've admired you for years. The two people I always go to to see if they're real is I go to their wife and I fell in love with Tessa. I was like, she's way freaking cooler than you, AJ. Way cooler. Like next level. What happened is like when I was hanging out with you and I found out about her private school, I'm like, we're dropping everything we thought we were going to talk about and we're going to go do a, a whole entire tour of her private school. And it was awesome, right? I, I mean, it's so awesome that I'm begging you guys to come and partner with me in Arizona. Like, let me be an investor in what you guys are doing. We're literally going down there on Saturday. I think it truly is like your guys' life mission. RV, uh, not RV, but self-storage is epic and it's cool and a lot of people can make a lot of money from it. But I truly, you know, love that story so much. So I looked at Tessa and then I looked at your team and I looked at the culture that you have and I'm like, dude, AJ is 10 times more of the man that I thought he was because of the team that you've acquired, right? And you don't acquire them by putting a job posting out there. You put, you acquire amazing people by being an amazing person. Yeah. Um, thoroughbreds want to hang out with thoroughbreds. They don't want to hang out with donkeys. And you only acquire thoroughbreds by becoming a thoroughbred. So to answer the question is not by myself. And to be very specific, I try to do everything on my own. I think a lot of people in here, I won't ask you to raise hands. People, something weird about Idaho and Utah, y'all don't like raising hands, just so you guys know. <laughs> in, in like the Midwest, if I say, hey, who, blah, 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 it's like people are raising two hands. They're so excited about it. There's so, I don't know what it is, okay? Um, but I think a lot of people in this room will struggle with, I've got to figure out how to do it all on my own. And I did that myself. 
it came from my background. It came from my father who taught me if anything's going to be done right, it's got to be done by you. Mm -hmm. um, my dad still says that to this day. He only has three people that, on his team. Um, in his company, he's a cabinet refinisher. And I watch him do his jobs. I'll stop by and I'll say hi to him at his jobs if I'm passing through a certain area. And I'll hear him say stuff to his employees at 65 years old. There's a reason why my dad has three employees is because my dad will go like this. Oh my gosh, I, I guess I'll just do it myself. Right in front of his own employees. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, I learned those same bad habits. I watched my father and we are all programmed from childhood. I watched my father do that. And then when I started my construction company, I did the same thing. And I found myself on my hands and knees frequently in, you're, you thought I was gonna say praying, but I wasn't praying, <laughs> um, installing toilets because I couldn't attract the right quality people to do the finish work on my property. So I would get properties finished, but then the last two weeks of the project is always the worst. It's the blue tape stuff and the final stuff and the detail and the you know tw tweaking this and turning this and blah, blah, blah. And I would end up having to do that all on my own. And it wasn't until, this, is, this was the moment my life changed. I was 26 years old and I decided I'm gonna become not just a contractor, but I'm gonna become also a loan officer. Now, why did I think that? Because I thought at the time, you know, this is 15 years ago, I thought at the time I just needed to do more in order to make more. I needed to trade more of my time for more money and so luckily it was a great decision for me because I ended up meeting a guy named Steve Mikesta. Shout out to Steve Mikesta. You guys don't need to remember his name. But I went on to his team as a loan officer. And so I was a contractor from like six o'clock in the morning till three o'clock in the afternoon. I would run on all my employees that I had at the time. And then in the afternoon I went and became a loan officer and I was on a guy named Steve Mikesta's team. Steve Mikesta forced me to hire a coach. He said, you can't be on my team. Nobody can be on my team unless you have a coach. And I'm like, freaking coach? What do I need a freaking coach for? Like, what are we playing football here, dude? Like, I don't need a coach. Just tell me what to do and I'll go do it. And that was my mindset. My mindset was that forever. I'm gonna do it on my own. I'm gonna figure it out. Broken, 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 broken mindset. And he forces me to hire this guy named John Bohm. John Bohm now, just to give you how prolific this guy is, he's now the head mindset coach for the Arizona Cardinals. And I hired John Bohm, not happily. I was frustrated that I had to hire this guy. And he was charging me $500 an hour. And I'm like, fine, begrudgingly, drove down to the, the address they, they gave me to meet with this guy. And I'm like, gosh, if I have to be on Steve Mikes' team, who's the top LO in like the Western United States, I guess I'll freaking do this gritting my teeth. And I pull up to the address and it's a Starbucks. I'm like, this dude wants to charge me $500 an hour to sit with him at Starbucks? Like, what kind of scam is this? And in 45 minutes, much like conversations with you, and I just listen to you and how obsessed you are with what you're obsessed with, and I, I get into your world, which I love, you know, doing with you, John Bohm changed everything about my, my world, every little part of my business. He had a way of understanding where I was, what was going on, and he would say, this is what he said to me all the time. He said, let me guess. This is how much money you have in your bank account. This is how much money you made last month, but you don't know where the money is. And he would go on and on and on, like a whole entire chapter he knew about me before I even had finished five minutes with him. He knew everything about me. And I was like, oh my gosh, I feel so exposed. I feel like somebody stripped me down, took all my clothes off, and I was sitting there naked. And I had nothing to, I had now at that point, no way to hide this stuff. He had the ability, like Superman, to see right through me like a good coach does. And... <clears throat> What he did is he says, this is what I'm going to do. I, I already know what your bottleneck is. You won't hire people that will actually take things off your plate. You're probably billing. You're collecting money yourself. You're doing this. You're doing this. You're doing this. You're doing this. I need you to hire this in your construction company. I need you to go hire somebody. I go, all right, I'll go do it. So I'm meeting John Bohm once a month. That's, that was my thing, my, my requirement. Man, I was so excited to be with him the, the next month. So pumped up. I actually like tucked my shirt in. I was pumped. And I walk into the Starbucks and I walk towards him. He stands up and he says, get the hell out of here. I'm firing you. He said that to you? To me. Yeah. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? What, 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 what? I'm like, this is in Starbucks. There's people there. People are ordering. This is like so abrupt and not expected. And he says, 
I can tell by the way you're carrying your shoulders that you did not do what I said to do. Your body tells me you did not accomplish what I set you out to do. You're fired. I don't coach. And he called me a name. I can't say it in Idaho. <laughs> and I was like, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm so sorry. You're right. I, I didn't hire that person. He said, if you promise me right now in this session that we're going to hire somebody in this hour that we're together, then I'll keep you on. And I go, sure, what, how do we do that? He goes, pull out your phone, pull, go on Craigslist, go on Facebook Marketplace, let's go put posts out there. I don't care what the posts are, let's take some action. Then uh, I left, and he, this is what he says, at the end of the session he says, if you don't hire somebody between now and next month to do this thing, don't show up. I'll be here, but I'm gonna be enjoying my coffee by myself. I don't wanna see you again, I don't wanna see your little weak and he's not a guy that would ever talk like this. He was very aggressive to me because he, he realized that's what I needed. I needed a, a daddy, essentially, somebody to yell at me. And um, that next day, I get a, a, a call from a girl named Anna Martinez. Anna Martinez ended up being on my team for 12 years. And in 30 days, Anna Martinez tripled my business. She was a $3,000 employee. You know what she did, AJ? What? Picked up the phone. I was so busy installing a toilet or doing a this or talking to a customer that other customers that were calling me were not getting a phone call. And is these little things of like, I'll call my customer back in, in three or four hours when I have a chance to versus I'm picking up the phone on the first ring when the person calls. It's those little subtle changes, those little tweaks in your business that so many people think it's not that big of a deal. I'm not going to hire the person. I'm not going to spend the money. And because John Bohm forced me to do that and gave me evidence and fruits of the labor, fruits that it actually worked, I then got addicted to seeing how that worked. So I would find things in my life and go, I'm going to solve this by hiring people. Well, that moment changed my life. And now I got addicted to building a team and realizing, oh my gosh, if I spend $3,000 on a base salary for this person, now this is 15 years ago. I couldn't hire somebody for $3,000 now, or $3,000 a month now. But he... She triples my business. I end up getting, the week she started, I got a call from Open Door. And Open Door said, hey, we're new to the Valley and we're looking for a contractor to hire. And that was my biggest customer for seven years. I would have otherwise missed that phone call. So it's stupid. I had literal, literal opportunities calling me, but I was too busy doing it myself to actually answer when opportunity called. So now I stumbled through. John Bohm actually ended up firing me about five months later because he got called to work for the Arizona Cardinals. So we still text back and forth. He watches my YouTube channel. He gives me little voice memos every once in a while. It's kind of great. But he ended up moving on, and I then made mistakes. I hired the wrong people. I hired people that were my mirror image of myself. I brought on partners when I could have hired it out. Made a lot of mistakes through this. And ultimately, I read the book, Rock of Fuel. And I found um, my five partners I have right now. Tommy's really good friends with one of them. They, they know how good my integrator partner is. He doesn't get anywhere near the credit he, he should. Um, I found my partner named Cody Barton. Him and I own four of our nine businesses together. And we do, I think, $50, $60 million a year together in revenue between those businesses. And then I found another partner named Josiah I was doing a lot of real estate deals with. And I identified that he was the polar opposite of me. And I found that him and I could work really, really well together. And now he and, I, him, he and I are partners on our fund. We're partners on our national title company. We're, so I, to give you a long way to answer the question, which is always how I answer questions, I'm so sorry. I had to learn to get over doing it myself. I had to learn through the hard road. And then I ultimately found partners that were the polar opposite of who I am. Who needed to hear that today? Yeah, that's right. Everybody's hands up. Yeah, because they sh all should be up. Um, who in here today, after this, realizes they're the one in their way? They're the one that's stopping their own success. I, there was a moment in my life, AJ, and I think you know you you've definitely reached that years ago. I've reached that now. That there was a moment where I went to a seminar, and the guy on stage says, "How many people paid to be here?" beyond just your ticket, your flight, your hotel, your everything. And of course, everybody raises their hand. He goes, you should 
utilize these three or four days to rely on your team, to tell your team that you're not available for three or four days. And I had no idea what that meant at the time because I didn't have a team. But he pointed out, he said, how many people here in three days are making more money? Their company's making more money than, than what this event is costing because their company is actually running. And it was surprising how many people were like, had their hands down. And I looked around, I'm like, oh my gosh, the majority of people here don't actually have a business. He, he, he said, you don't have a business, you have a hobby. You don't have a business until you can go somewhere for three or four days and your company continues to make money, even in your absence. And you know, one of the best things about my TV show, this was my next phase in my business. When I got the TV show three years ago, I am so grateful for that TV show more than anything else is that it forced me to not be available to my team. I would insert myself in meetings. I would insert myself where I didn't belong. My team didn't want me to be there. I hired the right people, but I would still show up and I would guide and direct and this, that, and the other. But then my TV show made it so people couldn't get a hold of me. They couldn't, they had to figure it out. And then my team now figured out a new way to run the business, which is the way it should have been in the, done in the first place. And now it's weird if I, show up, if I show up at the office, my team is like, oh my gosh, Pace is here. This is weird. Um, or people will say, hey, look, here's four new employees that you've never met. They've worked here for four months and you've never met them before. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that this is real and that I used to have a mindset that I was afraid to hire a $3,000 a month person. Like, it's just crazy, the mindset shift. You know, it, it's interesting because I don't think we all want to realize it, but everybody raised their hands, including uh, me. But um, that's pride, that's ego that's stopping uh, us from doing this. And I had to learn this the hard way because when I was a sales guy, everything I got, like I made the sell, I made the money, right? And so if I wanted to make more, I'd go out, do it again. And um, when I got paralyzed, obviously that ended. And I went from being someone that I thought, oh, I could do everything I can, I can make it, right, to I had other people bathing me. I couldn't go to the bathroom on my own. I was hooked to tubes to live on. And the best thing that ever happened to me, because it just tore away any remaining pride that had been left, it just was gone. It just nothing mattered. I just depended on someone for everything, every single second. And it made me a lot more okay with being dependent on other people and realizing that that didn't take away from me, right? But with them, I could do things that I couldn't do on my own. And uh, that's a hard lesson for us to learn. And I think one of the biggest reasons it's hard is we don't even recognize it. We don't recognize the fact because we think when you're doing it, you think, no, it's actually, this isn't a pride thing. I'll actually get down and I'll, I'll fix that toilet. That's not a pride thing. I'm fixing the toilet. Yeah, actually it's, um, you are, I'm a hard worker. Yeah, I'm exactly. doing. I'm doing what my parents told me to do. Do yeah. do the thing. Exactly. Do the, do the hard things. Do the th hard things. But in reality, what you're doing is other people can't do it like I can. That's pride, right? And I think we don't even realize it. And that's hard. But we get in our own ways. And you obviously, I mean, you cleared through that, and now you can do. I needed. So I needed evidence, man. To be honest with you, I needed evidence of a different life. The evidence that I had been gathering and garnering from my parents and the environment that I was in, I was in a blue collar environment, which was everybody left work or left home at six, came home at six, you know, 12 hour work days, showed up tired, complaining to their wife. Oh, I had a long day, you know, that whole thing. And that became my twenties. And I started seeing that. And I was lucky enough to be forced by Steve Mikes to hire that coach and wake me up and turn something else on. And then I saw the evidence. Here's the, the greatest evidence I saw. And I didn't know that this was a thing. Because I think part of it is e ego is a major part of it, if not number one. The next thing is that you think everybody wants to be you. Meaning you don't have people that just want to be on the team and sit in that, that seat on the bus. And that's a hard thing for entrepreneurs to realize until you see the evidence that I have people in my organizations, like my lieutenants, I have about 13 lieutenant. They're all women, by the way. Women are way better than men, uh, so many things. But everybody that's in charge of organizations um, are women. And I look at those women and they text me weekly or monthly and they just say, thank God that you came into my life because 
this position is exactly what I needed in my life. It answers everything for me. And I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, why didn't I do this 10 years earlier? I'm, it's the most fulfilling thing is to take, create something and create a position for somebody else that they can fulfill their dreams and they can live their life and they can take care of their children and they can do what they want to do. And I'm sitting there robbing people of that because I wanted to do it on my own. I, I would challenge you guys, anybody that's in AJ's inner circle, anybody that's in his world, I'll extend a gift to you guys that would have helped me a lot. If you guys ever want to take a tour of my office and just sit there and look at the positions, talk to the people in my organization, build a relationship, or even if you have a COO, if you want your COO to be my fr friends with my COO, or you have a CFO and you want your CFO to be friends with my CFO, I will extend all of that to you guys if you guys are in AJ's inner circle. Because seeing that in person is, there's light switch moments. I'll give you one that I just recently had myself in the last six months. You know, you and I are both friends with Ken McElroy and he says, hey, come, you know, man, we're, we always see each other at other events, but we never hang out in Arizona. Come up to my office. Let's hang out. I go, okay. So I go up there. This is six months ago. So you think I've figured it all out? I, ha I, have, I feel like I'm just warming up to figuring it all, to figure out anything. You know, there's so many things to learn, which is also fun. But I go to his office. He starts showing me positions in his company and what they do. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm taking notes. Like, oh, wow, that person does this, and they connect to that. And, oh, my gosh, that's amazing. Then he walks over to the coolest position I've ever seen in a company. And he says, oh, this is my favorite position. He walks me down, looks at the moniker on the, on the door, and it says, director of philanthropy. And I'm like, what? What, what does she do? And he says, her full-time job is to give a million dollars a month away. That's a, it does, if that doesn't open up your mind to what that world should look like and what you're trying to do here, I don't know what else is. I came home and I, I wrote like two hours of notes of what do I have to do and I was sending him voice memos. How do I reverse engineer? I want a position in my company that gives a million dollars away every single month. I want to get there. How do I re reverse engineer? Well, how you reverse engineer is you get in the proximity of the people that are doing it. That's how you do it. And that's why you're at these in, in these rooms. So anybody that's in AJ's inner circle, please reach out to me. Um, I'll give you guys my cell phone number. You guys can come and take a tour of my office, spend a day there, bring your team. I'll do whatever you guys want me to do, and I'll show you behind the scenes. That's, that's beyond incredible. What an offer. Yeah, that's nuts. You know, you talk about this proximity, and it's funny you bring up Ken McElroy. Just, uh, I don't know, whatever it was, six weeks or six months ago, we were looking at, our management style and we were having communication issues and things on from the facility to the ground to our property managers our district managers to you know these different things that were going on and i called ken the first uh, part of this year ken mcroy just like it i said hey man i need your help um i go you know oh we're having this issue and we started i started explaining to him he goes oh aj okay so here's what's going on repeated back to me exactly what was happening in a way that I was missing. And he said, I had sound, sounds thing. like John Bohm. Yeah, exactly. He's stripped you down. He knew yep. exactly where you were. Knew exactly. And then literally he's driving in his convertible. So sorry, it's all blown, but here's what you're going to do. And he goes, you're going to go to that middle layer of staff. You have, I did this two years ago, best thing ever. And he's like, you're just going to get rid of them. And he goes, do that. Let me know how it goes. I got to go. I'm driving. And then hung up the phone. <laughs> and so went back with the team and we talked about it. I'm like, yeah, we got to get rid of, this is causing all these communication issues and everything. And it was right. We did it. And all of a sudden it was like, holy cow. It was a major source to issues that we were having on the ground that we didn't understand because we were getting communication problems and layers. And it was just like that. Driving in his convertible, call him up, explain. He knew what was going on. I didn't. He knew exactly what to do. And he said, just go do it. And uh, these little things, right, are majorly impactful. It brought on tons of maybe structurals and systematic issues that the team, we hadn't even seen or done, and we could start tackling problems, really get to the source and the root of problems. It literally changed uh, the business and the direction we were headed. Dude, the other day I'm at, a, I'm at the airport. I'm out on the area where you, you get dropped off, right? And there's all the signs to go into what airline, right? Like Southwest, Delta, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, where the crap is American Airlines? Where is American Airlines? I cannot find American Airlines. And I'm looking around. I'm looking around. Oh, my gosh. I, I, they dropped me off in the right place. Maybe I'm at a di uh, but maybe it's at a different terminal. It's got to change. It's not here. 
I go, ma'am, where's American Airlines? She says, look up. American Airlines, right there. <laughs> and why, why do I say that? Because sometimes we're standing so close to our problem, we're standing so close to what's going on that we need somebody that's already been there that's 10 feet away from us to have no emotions about what's going on and actually give us permission, right? Give us permission to look up or give us permission to look at something that seems so close and right in front of your face, but you need that proximity to somebody who's been through it and also knows al already the path that can just go, here's the answer, boom. Look up. Unapologetically and just give you permission. I love that. It's so true. Um, now, a lot of people obviously know because all the big things you're doing scaling, you talk about not doing it yourself. One of the other things, though, that obviously people know you is from your overall marketing slash branding side, right? And you talked a little bit about this before, but this is something you've gone all in, but in a way that is not sleazy, right? In a way that's not like a lot of people think when they think marketing or even like, oh, build your personal brand or different things like that. It, it feels like, oh, I'm either being fake or I'm being sleazy, which none of that is true to you. Um, now, it doesn't mean you need to be doing what Pace is doing. It's not what we're talking about, right? But talk a little bit about that journey. Oh, that's a great journey. Um, if you go back, I've never deleted an Instagram post in my life. If you go back in my Instagram, it'll take you a long time. But if you just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, you'll see where, how, where and how I used to post. Um, I, somebody told me to download Instagram. This is now probably 14 years ago. They said, download Instagram. It's a great way for you to save your photos. That's why I downloaded it. I didn't download it for social media. I also, why I'm such an Android and PC hater, I, you'll hear me talk about this all the time, is because Microsoft Vista had just come out. Anybody remember Microsoft Vista? It was so bad. I had all my photos of the first flip, my, my everything on this computer. I upgraded to Microsoft Vista, gone. So I literally take this stupid tower and I throw it through the window at my house. And then I drive down to the Apple store and I'm like, I'm done and I'm full Apple. Anyway. <laughs> so somebody knew that that had, was a significant problem for me. They told me download Instagram and I just, I had, I was taking my wife on a trip to New York City, her first time to New York, and I just started documenting and getting people commenting, one or two people, like, oh, cool, this new app is here, right? So I took it and I started documenting my journey in my construction, that's it. I would just say, here's before, here's after, here's before, here's after. And I would hashtag like Arizona contractor, Arizona contractor, Arizona contractor. And then um, it never showed my face, didn't think anything of it. Just every day, I just made one little post of what I was doing, mistakes my team made, funny things that would happen, whatever. Wouldn't even tell stories. At the time, Instagram wouldn't even allow you to do videos. Now it's like, it's a completely different thing. It's way more powerful now than it was back then. And then I get a call one day. This lady's like, hey, are you for hire? I just saw your Instagram. I was like, what? Like, I thought only my friends were looking at this. And again, evidence. I had now evidence that I could make money from this stupid little thing. I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. I didn't know anything really about real estate at that time, so I didn't know how to, how to start doing it. But when I jumped into real estate and I had somebody help me get my first deal, what I started doing on Instagram is I was like, oh, okay, I already have evidence that in Instagram works. It's how I got Open Door. Open Door found me off a freaking hashtag, right? Arizona contractor, and they found me. So I said, all right, well, if I'm gonna do real estate, you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna document, I'm, I call it the Clint Eastwood strategy. Clint Eastwood, his best movie was the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so I said, look, I'm gonna post the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm gonna show, what did I learn today? What was the thing I learned? And I just documented, like, I'd say stuff like, well, today I learned what a memorandum was. Little stupid things like that. And so I never had to feel like I was faking. I never had to feel like I knew everything. In fact, I think my brand came from a, a place of authenticity, of being open and saying, I learned this. And other people would then start messaging me and go, tell me more about that. And I go, I don't have anything to tell you. That's all I know. Yeah. And that went on for a while, brick by brick. And then next thing you know, people started asking me to go on ride alongs and it started compounding. And um, I had somebody, I think the biggest turning point in my brand was when somebody went around my back on a deal. This is probably eight, nine years ago. 
I get a lead out of Colorado. Seller lives in Colorado. He has a summer home in Arizona. His wife is falling ill. They want to sell the summer home in Arizona and get rid of it. And we strike a price verbally over the phone, but he says, I need you to meet me in person in order for me to sign this contract. I go, no problem. I'll send a mobile notary, bro. That's easy. He's like, no. Is the mobile notary buying my house or are you buying my house? I go, well, I am. He goes, I'm signing the deal whoever, with whoever's going to do, um, who's going to buy the deal. I want to look the man in the eye. It's like, okay, I'll FedEx it to you. I'll figure something out. He's like, no, you need to be here physically and sign with me. So I go online and I make a post and I say, uh, this is on a website. I won't say the name of the website, but I went on this website. And what ended up happening is a guy, I got criticized. It was like, why aren't you a, a licensed realtor? Why aren't you a licensed realtor? I was like, whoa, okay, that's mean. Got it. No problem. I then get a guy named Pete to call me. Calls me like two days later. I've got now like a day before the guy decides to go sell with somebody else. Pete calls me up and he goes, hey, dude, I saw your post. I'll go to your meeting for you. I'll go talk to the seller and I'll say we're partners. We'll just JV on the deal. Um, give me the address. Give me the seller's name and information. I'll go do it. Okay, well, I get a call from the seller the next day. And the seller says, hey, just so you know, your buddy Pete tried to do a workaround on you. He told me that you're a wholesaler. He actually printed out the, the post that you made on the forum. And he showed me your post that you were looking for a JV. And I was like, imagine being on that phone call, being called out by that seller. Right? It's a little thing, but... Still, it's like feeling exposed in that moment. You're like, oh my gosh. And I said, I'm so sorry. And he says, there's nothing to be sorry about. This is business. We struck a price. I told you I'd sell it to you. So if you can still make it to me, then we'll, we'll, I'll still sell it. Very, very long story short, I drive up to Colorado. Couldn't get a flight to like get up to where he was. Drive there, get the deal signed. Made $7,000 on the deal. But the most important part of it was the drive home and how I felt that somebody went around me in my back and that I didn't have access to people around the country that I could rely on. I didn't have what I now call a community. And so that weekend I came home and I was like, out of spite and vengeance, not, all, and not everything is beautiful motivation. Sometimes I, rocket fuel comes from anger. Mm -hmm. And I was angry. I felt like somebody stabbed me in the back and I felt like I had a chip on my shoulder. So what I did is I went on Instagram and um, I had maybe 500 followers at this time. And I said, who wants to go on a ride along? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do the opposite of what that guy just did to me. And I did my first ride along. And I became known for doing ride along. So this is what I said. I said, Instagram stories had just come out. This is eight, nine years ago. And I went on my Instagram stories. I said, whoever wants to learn this business, I'm going to be the guy that just gives freely. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you guys how to operate properly. Meet me at Circle K at six o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning, and I'll take you on my rounds. We'll visit properties. We'll do this. I'll take you on appointments with sellers, even private money lenders. I'll have you, I'll introduce you to my people, whatever. And I show up to Circle K at six o'clock in the morning. How many people showed up? Zero. Zero people showed up. So this is what I did. One of the best ways to optimize management and to increase the value of your self-storage facility is through property management. And that means you're going to need really good property management software. That's where Tenant Inc. comes in. These guys have a huge amount of tools at your fingertips that you guys can deploy to extract the maximum amount of value and deploy the maximum amount of value at your storage facility. Again, this is Tenant Inc. Be sure to check them out. They're all things property management. It's Check them out. Link is in the show notes. Zero people showed up. So this is what I did because I'm a businessman. I'm not going to give up. So throughout the day, I'm making my stops. My car's in the, the backdrop, and I'd take my phone, and I'd go take a photo, put it on stories, and I'd say, the people in this car are getting so much value today. <laughs> Nobody was there. Yeah. So the, the few people that followed me that were in Arizona at the time, um, they were like, oh, my gosh, I didn't know you were doing this. I, I'm just seeing this now. Are you still going to do this? I go, yeah, I'm going to do it. So I do it the next Saturday. And Saturday, 6 a.m., Circle K. How many people show up? Three people, which is a perfect fit for my Prius. <laughs> so I'm like, this is great. So I take three people around. And what's cool about these three people, this is a long time ago. I had Scott Garcia, Debbie Lou, and a guy named Tim. 
Debbie Lou is my biggest private money lender still to this day. Scott Garcia was a school, a high school wrestling teacher that retired like four years ago from all the things that he learned from me. He, uh, the weirdest thing happened a couple months ago. So eight years later now, I get a call from one of my buddies. He goes, dude, I just want to, I want to, I want to tell you a cool little story that just happened to me. I have an Airbnb in here in Tempe. This guy stays there. He's seen me on your Instagram now. And he says, oh, you're Pace's friend. And I, I go, yeah, like, who are you? How, do you? how do you know Pace? You're just my Airbnb guest. He goes, Pace changed my life. I quit my job. I did this. I'm worth $7 million now, blah, 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 blah. I was a high school wrestling coach. And he's like, how did Pace change your life? He goes, he did a meetup at Circle K and took me around and showed me how to do things. That is like the seeds that I planted eight years ago are still, I'm harvesting them still to this day. But those three people, now I, on, the, on the ride along, I took them on appointments and I showed them how to sign contracts and I did the things and I now had real people in my car to actually take photos with and go, oh, Debbie Lou is taking, Debbie Lou's getting value and Scott Garcia is getting value. And so the following week I did it again. And um, how many people showed up this time? 63 people showed up. <laughs> 63 people because what ends up happening is when you do something for somebody else, it's infectious. I didn't know this at the time. I was doing this out of spite, anger, resentment. And I was like, I'm going to I'm going to create something that doesn't exist in my mind. Maybe it did somewhere else but, and nobody was talking about it, but in my mind it didn't exist. And so 63 people show up. Circle K calls the cops cuz they're like, "You guys, this is a gang fight." Like <laughs> <laughs> this bunch of homeless people fighting in Circle K parking a lot. What the heck is going on? You, and I, they come out and they talk to me and they go, who's in charge? Who's in charge? Oh, it's that guy. They talk to me. What are you doing? A uh, real estate meetup? They're like, at six o'clock in the morning at Circle K? Go somewhere else, you idiot. And so we went across the street in an empty parking lot and I just talked to everybody all day long for like 14 hours. And I was like, we should probably start doing this at my office. So every Friday I started doing little meetups at my office and I Next thing you knew, I, all the biggest real estate investors, they would send their teams to my meetups on Fridays to go, look, go learn what Pace is teaching on that stupid whiteboard of his. And then I started getting calls from people um, saying, hey, will you come do one of those meetups in my town? I was like, sure. But I already had evidence of what a meetup meant to me. A meetup was always, has always been my brand. Meeting in physical proximity to people, feeling the vibration, the anti-AI is what I call it, the anti-AI. And why is it the anti-AI? Because AI is going to come in and infiltrate all of our businesses. A lot of jobs are going to be lost. Entire industries will be lost. But one thing that will always prevail and actually grow is communities of people that are in proximity, physical proximity of each other. And so I started growing this thing. And I knew from the evidence of doing them at my office that I get my private money lenders. I get deals. Like today, I bought four deals from people that I was at a meetup in Utah. I go, this is what I'm looking for, boom, 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 boom. Four days later, I got four deals that got sent to me today via text. I committed to all four of them, I'm buying them. That's what happens with a meetup is deals get done. And so for me, my brand was never intentional to go, I wanna be a big YouTube guy. I wanna be a big U Facebook or Instagram guy. Everything was for me was how do I do more meetups and get more people to come out and meet with each other and how do I do it all over the country? That was always my, my intention. It was never, how do I become a big brand? Yeah. And so I think, I know that's a long way to answer the question. I'm just a long context guy. Hopefully that gives you guys context, but I never had the intention. I never sat down and go, how do I become a big brand? Mm -hmm. That was never my thought process. It was good, bad, ugly, showing people what I'm learning and then doing things that actually help people, which is getting f people together. But I think that's what, you know, that's what makes it. It's so funny because when I, who, who read the book, uh, growing wealth and self storage, anybody in here read my book? Yeah. So when we looked Dang. at it, bro, uh, you must be an international bestseller. It's like 90% of the audience yeah, for, for these people right here. <laughs> so my people like me, uh, my storage people. But, um, when I, uh, wrote the book, it was actually because I found out that somebody in our space was charging these ridiculous amounts to teach people something very simple or whatnot. And I just didn't like it. I was like, Oh, this is like highway robbery. I was very upset about it. And uh, so I, I said, I'm like, Oh, I can teach everything and more. And I can do it in a book that I can give away and you don't have to pay a hundred thousand dollars. Right. 
And so it was out of that that I simply kind of wrote this book. And then I'm like, and I could do this on a podcast, right? And I can start just teaching people and trying to help, uh, uh, help them out. And uh, that, for me, I, I liked that, like you obviously do. But then I think it, it kind of set me apart, my podcast area, where I was totally transparent. And I, there was no catch. There was no catch at the end of the podcast. There was no hook. There was no anything. It was just, here's everything that we know. Here's what we learned. Here's what we think, right or wrong. There's not going to be this big ask or anything else. It's just, it's here. You want to do business with us, do business with us. And then that started to just lead into things. I was um, in Tampa, and I won't say what the event, because a lot of them are my friends, but I was in Tampa speaking on stage, and the group was a bunch of coaches. And I, my piece of advice, I go, Pace, how are you winning? How are you doing this? How, you know, and I basically did a list of 20 reasons why I'm winning, and the number one reason I, I, I told them I was winning is because I stopped treating people like pin cushions. And I'm like, these are people I want to do business with. I, keep, I t take the relationship with them very seriously, and I show it. And then this is what you did. You basically, out of spite or anger or frustration or um, whatever, you said, I want these people to be treated like people and future business partners. How would you think about everybody in your audience as a future business partner? Yeah. Think about that. And that is who you're talking to. And that's what you do incredibly well. Yeah. Everybody else looks at them as I'm a, you're a pin cushion for me to charge you a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. And how do I elevate you to that thing? It's, it's, the word is grotesque, I would say. Grotesque, I completely agree with that. And I think that's the thing when you guys, when we talk about your brand, right? It, you can call that image, but we used to call it reputation. Mm. That's what it used to be called, your reputation. And for me, my reputation was important to me. Coming in through sales, right? And in a small town uh, from Idaho, it was everything because there was no internet, you couldn't Google somebody. So it was just whoever talked about you. And I viewed that as the, even though people said the world got bigger and everything, it was still small. Everybody in storage, we know everybody, right? It, it's a small industry, it's tight knit. And so I, we try to bring that through. And that I think today is just your brand. And that comes through, it's not forced. It's natural and it's organic and people feel and they're attracted to it. You know, in a weird way, I can be transparent here this is not going on youtube or anything but um i get a lot of people that will or is it uh, george are you putting this on youtube okay just yeah I'll, I'll be i'll temper i'll temper my thoughts a little bit so i i'm at a point now where i get people that reach out to me and they're trying to give me guidance on my brand yeah they're bigger than me in yeah. by a long way like big, if I told you the names, you'd be like, oh my gosh, I've got people reaching out to me that are the names in not just real estate, but like business in general, international names. And they come to me and they go, okay, you're at a point where blah, blah, blah is going to happen and such and such is going to happen. And da, 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 da. Um, let me tell you, let's align here and let's do this, that, and the other. I'm like, oh my gosh, bro, I just want to do a meetup in a parking lot. <laughs> yeah. I just want to be authentic to who I am. I want, to, I want to continue to do what I'm doing. I'm on a mission, and you're trying to deviate me because you think my goal is to build brand. That's never been my goal. Never been my goal. My, you're, you don't do b good business on a daily basis because you're like, I'm going to build my reputation. You do good business because that's who you are. Yeah. And your reputation gets built off of that. And so it's the same thing with brand is that I think a lot of people are afraid to go build a brand because it sounds hokey, cheesy, Lamborghini yeah. type. By the way, there was a Lamborghini in I Idaho. I don't know what's up with all you fancy Idahoans, but <laughs> all you potatoes here. Um, but I think a lot of people are afraid of that, but reputation is really what it is. And I appreciate you saying that because that now I'm going to start using that. Thank you, AJ. I'm going to steal that. Now, I had a, the next thing you, you, as you created this brand organically and you're growing your business, you were hiring people to help you. That was allowing you to do things that were much more impactful. And as that, it, it becomes a self-fulfilling cycle, right? Mm -hmm. You're being impactful, that's going back to your core businesses, they're growing, everyone's doing better, you're getting people that you need within your business that are being attracted to you, right? All that. Um, talk to me about growing the business and as you were growing it, how involved were you at what points and at what points did you step away? Um, 
I'm a 100% involved or responsible for every idea that we monetize on. Everything that we make money on comes from me, right? That's the visionary in me. I come up with an idea. I come up with a product. I come up with a way of selling a thing or repackaging a blah, blah, blah. Um, or, hey, let's go and build. Let's, uh, hey, you know what we should be doing? I, I see what's happening in the marketplace. Let's go after expired listings. Here's how we're going to build the team. I'm going to go attract these types of people. I would say the majority, and this is crazy. I don't know if anybody wants to hear this. I'm, I just got to be honest. If you get a really good integrator partner, they will fight you on every idea you have. Every idea you yeah, have. My, my team's listened to me and, and, and Sam. In, in the office you, right. they fight you on everything uh, here's what I have to do like even Eric you'll see Eric right here two years ago I hire Eric I have nine businesses but I also have a tenth payroll and that payroll is my personal payroll why do I have a tenth payroll why wouldn't Eric when I first hired him why wouldn't he be on the actual payroll of one of my companies well because my integrator partner fights me on every single thing I do but that's the sign of a good integrator. They're protecting the bottom line. They're watching things. Prove to me that this is going to work. And I'm like, everything I do makes money. And his immediate, this is Cody that you guys know really well. So I go, fine, I'm not going to fight with you. I'm going to hire this person. They're going to be on my, per, their, my personal payroll for 90 days. I'm going to prove that their position is going to work and make money in the organization because I have this new idea that's going to go blah, blah, blah. And then I prove it. I spend the money and I go, here's the numbers. Here's the this. Go put them on the team. That's called self-storage income for me. I get to do whatever I want in it, and so I can blow money, and I can uh, drive people out. <laughs> there you go. And my integrators can't tell me no. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I, spe I do spend a lot of my personal capital to go. I did that with, I probably this year, um, I probably hired 20 people on my personal payroll because I find amazing people when I go around the country and speak. I find people at meetups. I find unbelievable ideas. I'll talk to somebody and go, that's an amazing idea. What if we do it this way? Like, here's a great idea. This is, an, this is one of the newer ideas. Think about if you're a private money lender and somebody comes to you and goes, hey, I've got a single family house. I just need money. I need a bridge loan for like six months. I'm going to fix and flip it. Something as basic as that. How do I know that that borrower is a verified borrower? Meaning it's their real name. They have experience. They don't have experience. I'm okay with them not having experience. They're not a felon, right? They have no marks against them in terms of bad lending practices. They've paid back all their private money lenders, et cetera. So I run into this girl who's an FBI investigator. She um, basically does background checks for people in, for, in the FBI and then deep dives into all of them. I go, you know what we should do is we, we should create a real estate blacklist. We should create a list that if I'm a private money lender, I should go, have you, do you have a, 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 we're calling it the borrower's passport. So you get a background check, you get all these things that you say, here's my licenses, here's my experience. If you don't have experience, that's perfectly fine. And so now as a private money lender, I go, do you have a borrower's passport? I want to see your borrower's passport. It costs 300 bucks or whatever. And then that way, in 10 years, everybody in the industry says, here's my credentials that I've borrowed 15 different people's monies. Here's their test. Their test. It's like Yelp for investors. That's basically what it is. It's Yelp for investors. You imagine if you had Yelp for investors, Yeah. if you could be, if you could go, and, I, and this is where the idea came from. I had a girl in my, one of my private Facebook groups. She says, I quit my job. I saved $15,000 from all my cash flow. She bought a couple of sub two deals and she's got this cash flow coming in. I'm going to use this $15,000. I want to do a flip next. Okay, great. But I need a hard money lender. One of my other private um, Facebook group members gives her a link to a hard money lender that she found in a non-private Facebook group. It turns out to be like a Somali scammer that is a fake hard money lender that says to her, hey, we'll happily give you a loan on your next deal. Just put 15, wire us $15,000 as a down payment and we'll, and we'll wire the money to title. You know how many of these things are going on right now? There's so much fraud in real estate. So... I see those things in the, in the thing. I see the, those things in the industry. I go, oh, that's an idea that would actually help out the industry that solves a problem that vets hard money lenders, it vets borrowers, it vets lenders, it vets these people. It's basically Yelp for real estate. Yeah. Same thing with me. If I'm on stage and I say I own 2,100 assets, I want to make sure that I've been verified. Those assets have been verified. Those assets have been verified before I go and speak on stage. So I come up with that idea. My integrator immediately repels against every idea. So I go create that business and monetize on it. And then I pass it on to my 
integrator partner, I go, it's monetizing now. I need to step away and I don't need to be involved. In fact, Pace is dead. I'm no longer involved. I need to go out and find the next thing. Yeah. So I'm involved to those degrees where the money-making opportunities, the initial 10 to 15 employees, I inspire them to come onto the team. I can craft what are the roles, the responsibilities of those people, and then I, my goal is to monetize in 90 days and then pass it on to one of my integrators. You know, I look at um, organizations and uh, leadership, and I've always viewed that the leadership role is, uh, I, I, I think of it like a degree of separation. So you have your ground floor, and then if you are one degree of separation, it means you're not doing it, but you are orchestrating the ground floor employees, right? So you're one degree from the thing. And then as you move up, your second degree of separation is managerial, right? That's manager people. I feel like I did good at one and at two, then three started to get really hard because three degrees of separation was now uh, a new layer of not manager, but more of uh, higher level C-suite people that are doing way more of the building, right? They're doing a lot more of that. And then that you're completely isolated a lot from that ground floor and it shrinks on that three degree, your contacts, your, your people, right? So we had to move me out, get me out of meetings. So it's like, all right, AJ, you're not on any meetings. My schedules got really, really, really clear. And uh, they're like, hey, you're gonna go talk to people. You're gonna go, right, do these things. And then uh, my direct reports is basically, you know, three people. Uh, other than that, they're all going to other people. Um, how do you align at your level? First of all, direct reports, are those just per se your integrators? Yep, my integrators do it, my, my partners do it, are the only people that direct report to me. Nobody, yep. No employee direct reports to me. Even Eric, who I spend a lot of time with, he doesn't direct report to me at all. He has a manager above him, she has, who does Giselle have above her? Adriana, our COO. Oh, she's the top of that organization, but our COO is above her. So um, he's like five layers underneath him and I talk, we, I cast a vision, that kind of thing, but mm -hmm. him and I don't talk about money, him and I don't talk about his position. We're just, yeah. I get to be friends with my employees, which is nice. Um, I'm not, not involved in- Budgets though for, you know. I used to. Yeah. yeah. I used to, and then I would also be neurotic about it, and I realized that I just needed to hire better people. Yeah. And, and that know more than I do. And one of the best, the, one of the best companies you guys, I'll give you guys this contact. There's a company called the Collab Team. Okay, so who knows the book Traction? Okay, I'm gonna tell you straight up. If you're good at running level 10 meetings, oh my gosh, God bless you. There's no way I'll ever be good at running a level 10 meeting as, as it's described in the book Traction. So there's a company called the Collab Team that will actually run your level 10 meetings for you. And so we actually ended up hiring them three years ago. So um, the collab team runs all nine of our level 10 meetings for all of our organizations. And I get a video report every single Friday of every single one. So my partners don't even report to me. Yeah. The collab team does. So they go through every organization. They do videos on everything. They cost, um, do you want to know how much they cost? Yeah. $2,500 a month per company. That's it. Wow. Think about that. Yeah. If they're running a level 10 meeting, how often are you guys doing the level 10 meeting, Eric? Once a week. I'm not involved. Um, used to be in the meetings a lot. I never went to the meetings. Somebody that knows how to run the meetings properly and is that, that is their core. They are like, I was put on this earth to run meetings like this for companies and replace their C-suites need to be in all of these meetings. And they track all the rocks, they do all the things and they send video reports. So in two hours on a Friday, I can catch up with everything that's going on inside of my organization, and then I will reply back to my partners. I won't reply to the collab team because I don't want the collab team having direct access to me. I will reply to Cody or Josiah or Ted or John or Molly, and I'll say, hey, here's my thoughts on such, such, and such. Can you please take care of this? That's literally all I'm involved. Took a while to get there, and I wish I knew about the collab team because the collab team at $2,500 a month per organization probably saves us a hundred hours of wasted meetings, wasted time, weird communication, emails, all sorts of things that go on. The collab team is a game changer. Now, 
with that uh, you know, workflow things, I think a lot of people, especially people in this room, a lot of you are building, you have built, you're expanding, you're looking at, okay, well, how are we doing this for next project, right? You're in charge of growth. Well, when uh, you're in charge of growth, because I think a lot of people in here, growth, but you're doing the thing still, all of it. In fact, way too many of you people are even at your facility. So when you look at uh, you know, their inboxes, they got a million emails, million texts, they're inundated uh, from the thing, the, or what they're doing, right? As opposed to the growing. Uh, how much time do you spend on certain actions like that? Like oh, email. Oh, great, email. Like okay, so this is the true answer. I'm just gonna tell you the honest answer and some people just don't wanna live their life this way, so I'm just telling you what I do. I wake up at four o'clock in the morning I don't want to touch my email all day long. So by from four o'clock to about 6.30 in the morning, I answer all my Slack messages, all my email messages. I correspond with our, our teams on anything that people have questions about uh, for me, and I plan my own day. Now, do I have an assistant? Yes, I have an assistant, but I'm better at planning my day than my assistant. I'm not gonna let, she needs to know what I plan for the day, not the other way around, at least in my world. And so um, I am done with email. My email is literally zero inbox by 6.30 in the morning. I have not a single email, nothing. If you look at my inbox, I probably, I've been traveling the last four days, so I haven't had a t t chance to op uh, kill it, like inbox zero. I probably, my oldest email is probably from Monday mm -hmm. that I haven't replied and, in and like categorized. My Slack messages, so nobody texts me, everybody's slacking, or you guys, Eric, on your guys' team, what do you guys use? Um, Everything is on Slack? Okay, so everything on, on Slack, and then we also use, what's our organization tool that you guys use? Notion, okay, so they use Notion to organize projects. This is the same thing in our real estate business. They'll use Slack to communicate with each other, keep track of every single property that we own. You know, here we closed escrow on it here, here's what's going on with the contractors, here's the problems, everybody's on the same exact thread. Is anybody not using Slack in here, in your organization? It's Honestly, one of the greatest tools you'll ever have in your life is Slack. It will get rid of a lot of your emails, a lot of your text messages. If you ever feel like you have too many text messages and emails, it means you're not using Slack properly. We use, what is it, Teams? Is Teams, Teams similar to Slack? Yeah. Yeah, love it. Cool, yeah. So uh, you guys are using that at Directed IRA? Okay, I didn't, so I don't know. I'm at a point now where originally I told my team, I go, I don't want to be involved in anything. I didn't know this until I, I have a coach now that helps me out. <clears throat> My partners all have coaches. They all spend a good amount of money on, on personal coaches that are like aggregating information from other business owners and saying, hey, these people are using these tools. You should use those tools, all that kind of stuff. Slack has been the thing that's been super helpful for us. So for me, I don't do any of those things. And then as far as the real estate goes, my, I have five different buckets of acquisition, okay? Only one of them am, am I involved in. Those five buckets, do you guys wanna know this stuff? Okay. Five buckets of acquisition. So um, acquisition number one is solo single family, meaning I own them myself. No partners, Cody doesn't own them with me, Josiah doesn't own them with me, I own them myself. Um, those deals come from relationships with real estate agents um, and just working with me or people sending me opportunities from social media or whatever else. I will buy those only in Arizona and Vegas. Sub two seller finance only, F sub $500,000. I probably buy four to five of those a month. I don't touch those, I commit to them. They go to Molly, which then Molly passes them to Heidi, and Heidi takes them and onboards them to the TC team, runs them all the way through. I'll never hear about that proper property ever again in my life. Goes to a property management team, I, don't, I never hear about it other than a financial report, which I probably won't even read. Yeah. My CFO will read it, he'll tell me if there's a problem, which you know, sometimes there is, sometimes there's not. Um, so that's bucket number one. Bucket number two is small multifamily, Anything from 30 to 150 units, seller finance and subject to only, Sunbell States, me, myself, and I only, no partners, no private money lenders, doing those on my own. I currently have $45 million in the pipeline between now and December 31st, um, just on that bucket, okay? Uh, bucket number three is single family with my students. So I went to a point where I go, I don't wanna buy all over the country anymore but I will buy all over the country with my students as long as they're my 50-50 partner. So a student brings a sub two deal to me and I'll fund 
the closing costs, the thing, blah, blah, blah. I'll remain, keep them on as 50% partner. And that also goes into a team. I don't want to own in 50 states, but I will if I have boots on the ground partner, which is my student there on single family stuff. Bucket number four is my fund. And so I have an entire fund. I have six people on that fund. I have two investor relations. I have two acquisition people. I have a head of fund and I have an asset manager in that. Um, our goal is to acquire $100 million this year and we'll do that. And um, then bucket number five is buying businesses, service-based businesses that are, you know, plumbers, handyman, et cetera, that we can, or property management companies, car washes, laundromats, et cetera. And this year we bought roughly $10 million of revenue essentially is what, what it is. We bought a company at 5 million and two companies that were doing two and a half million dollars each. So I'm buying businesses again with creative finance and that goes to Cody, my partner, and we have a C-suite that operates all of those. I, you don't, I don't get to talk about this that often, to be honest, um, because it's discouraging for people that are new. But I'm gonna be really honest with you. At some point, you become, you have a reputation, and you will buy more deals from your reputation than you will from an acquisition team. There will come a point where I could turn off my acquisition department and never need another acquisition person. I will never worry about buying 200, 300 million dollars a year in real estate. I, there will come that point. One way that I've hacked this, this is a really genius thing that I've done. I go, I'm gonna hire a full-time underwriter just for my community. So I pay a guy, his name's Bo, $15,000 a month. What does Bo do? Bo teaches my community what to go look for for my buy box. They go look for it, they bring it back to Bo, Bo says, I don't like that structure. Go fix this, 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 and this. They go fix it. They bring it back to Bo. Bo says, I like that. Can pace buy it. That's all he does all day long is he just helps people. And, what, what, you know, we'll pay them an assignment fee. They sell the deal to us. Um, and Bo just sits there and underwrites people for people all day long. He has an open office eight hours a day, sits there on a Zoom. And my students go in there and go, I have a deal. Can you underwrite it? Single family, RV parks, storage facilities, multifamily, whatever. And He's basically telling them, go fix this. That balloon is, a, that's a bad balloon. It's going to pop. I don't like that balloon. That's toxic debt. Da, 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 da. And it's 40 hours a week where he's just coaching people on how to structure deals properly. And guess who's the number one benefactor of that? Me. Out of the $48 million I have in my solo multifamily portfolio, uh, pipeline, I think like 25 million of that has just come from Bo underwriting for people. And I'm paying 15 grand a month for that. But you look at like the R, look at the R, the two RV parks that I just bought in Glacier. Combine those two. I bought them seller finance. They're making sixteen thousand dollars a month, month one. I'm at a point now where I don't acquire an asset and go, oh, how can I buy a boat? How can I buy another car? How can I spend more money? I'm at a point where every time I buy another asset, all I'm doing is looking at that asset as who can I afford to hire to add to the team based on that cash flow from that asset. And you've been at that point for a long time. So like the RV park allowed me to go, I'm going to hire another underwriter. My underwriter has actually been one of the greatest acquisition mechanisms of all time. Think about if you just went out to like free Facebook groups and you go, Hey guys, I'll just underwrite for you all day long. You think you'd buy some deals? Yeah. It's the num one of the number one things newbies don't have is ha somebody to underwrite for them. Right. Inner circle. Should I get, should I get an underwriter for get an underwriter to help us all push this guy to go spend 15 grand a month on you guys. It's a good idea. Um, all right. Final question. Uh, work life balance. Oh, work life balance. How do you feel about it? What is your, I'm the best at it. Yeah. I'm the best at it. I'll tell you why. And you're really good at it too. I married a woman that understands who she married. And I also recognize that from 1970 till now, parents spend 700% more time with their kids than they could have in the 1970s. So I have context and I'm not spoiled. And I understand how amazing it is that I can work from home and I have all these things. I see my children way more than somebody who has a nine to five job does. I also have a responsibility to my children to show them what is possible in life not to be the person that's sitting around all day long watching TV with them. Yep. And I watch how you, you and Tessa do the same thing with your family. Um, your work-life balance is amazing. I have two offices. I have an office with roughly 300 pe people in it and another office that is a, a different partnership. 
I don't go to either office. I bought a home that allows me, I know you're the same way, your house is unbelievable. You, I bought a home that allows me to be home and walk down to my basement and do the things I need to do and be away from everything, but not have to drive to work or do this, that, and the other. When I'm home, I am like six, seven, eight, nine, ten, sometimes hours a day with my kids. This has been a heavy year of travel because I knew we were going to have another baby and I was going to stop traveling for half a year. So I've been condensing a lot more travel. But my work-life balance is amazing because I have a wife that understands what she signed up for. 100%. When I was on date number one with my wife, Kona Grill, didn't even ask her what her middle name was. And I said, if you have any thing in your body that says you want to marry a lazy man, don't go on a second date with me. I have, I am like volcano running through my, I have like volcanic whatever running through my blood. I will never run out of energy. I will wear you out and you will be grateful when I'm gone once or twice a week. Yep. And so that's the, that's the reality is my wife does miss me. She loves me, of course. And my kids, you guys want to hear something funny? My, my daughter, she was sending me videos before we came out here. She sent me a video and she says, Hey dad, I, What's a, what do you, what is a raccoon? There's this raccoon that like, if you pick it up, it farts in your face. What is that? I was like, what the crap are you talking about? What are you talking about? And my wife's like, I have no idea what she's talking about. She goes, it's, it's black and white. I'm like, that's not a raccoon. It's a skunk, dude. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, I get a, you know, I'm, I'm never away from my family more than two days at a time. Typically my wife and kids travel with me a lot. You'll see them with me on the plane a lot. This last four or five months, it hasn't been that way because um, of the. She's also pregnant with our probably final child. Um, but work-life balance, I don't think it is hard for people when you marry the right person and you have the right expectations. I pe I think the people that think work-life balance is something they're lacking, I think is something that they're lacking in their marriage. But this is coming from my own perspective. I could be completely wrong, but what I hear is it's typically a man coming to me and go, how can I get my wife on the same page with me? I want to work night and day. I want to provide for her. And I go, you haven't had a conversation with her. Yeah. You haven't gotten her on the same page. You haven't told her why you're trying to do these things. You also haven't provided evidence that you, like if you're spending two years just absorbing in content and you're not taking action, I would also be upset as your wife too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But if you had this conversation with her and you said, look, I'm not going to make money for two years. I need to learn a lot of information. Then I'll start making money. The context is there. And the yep. expectations there, have you had that conversation? You go, oh man, that's a really great idea. I should probably do that. I'm like, oh my gosh. So it's not a work-life balance thing. It's a communication thing with your spouse. And um, I also get it from women. Women go, how does your wife, this is going to hurt. I don't think anybody in here is failing. So that's, that's good. But I get women that come to go, how does your wife deal with you? Mm -hmm. I go, how do you deal with your fat, lazy piece of shit husband? Yep. Yeah. I don't say that out, out loud, by the way. <laughs> I, in my mind, I say that. But out, outwardly, I say, I, I don't know. Like, do you, what does your husband do when he comes home from work? Well, he's with the kids. Okay, great. And what is he doing with the kids? And it always results to some sort of TV watching or some sort of lazy activity. He's not taking them out fishing or doing something fun or showing them how to do anything. He's not driving for deals, which you could do with your kids too. He's not doing anything enterprising with his kids. He's just wasting time. Yeah. And I'm like, is that what you really want your husband to do? It, so it's, it's a communication thing. I don't know if that's helpful for anybody, but. Um, have I, a conversation, everybody. Yeah, have a conversation. You do. I had a lady, last thing I'll say about this. I, I, I was in um, Lafayette, Louisiana. I think is the name of it. And I'm at a meetup. We're at this little, of course, it's like a gumbo restaurant. That's all they have there. It's like <laughs> Starbucks there has like gumbo flavored coffee. And we're hanging out and there's a lady that says to me, she's like, how does, how does your wife deal with it? Like you being gone. And the lady next to her says, his wife is lucky. My husband's a shrimp boat captain and he goes out for two weeks at a time. And when he comes home, he has to run the other business. And I see him maybe once or twice, like one or two hours before we go to bed. And I didn't have the chance to answer the first woman before the second woman then looks at her and goes, you should be grateful. 
And I was like, wow, okay, I'm not going to say anything. But gratitude and, and lack of perspective, I think, is where a lot of people are, are failing there is that, are you on the same page? Do you have a common mission? Is your family trying to accomplish things? I, I mean, look what you and Tessa are, are doing. Uh, over Undertaking a freaking private school in the midst of the United States tearing down our education system, that's a big mission for a family to have. Yep. And if it requires some Saturdays and some sacrifice, by all means, you guys are happy to do it. 100%. Nobody's complaining about the work. You're grateful for the work. Yeah. So I think um, entitlement is the disease. Yeah. Gratitude is the cure. I love it. That's what we're ending on, everybody. Yeah. Pace, thank you, dude. Love it.